It's national meets regional. It's sidewalks entertainment. The long running celebrity. Music. And art series. Join us for a new path to arts and entertainment. In the life we had, I won't forget. Rich in living, dead. Today I made a payment on my loan. And I'm going home. I'm going home. Wherever that may be, I'm going home. Hey guys, welcome to Sidewalks Entertainment. Richard R. Lee here. Hope you're having a good day because we're going to have a good day because we have Spencer Day here today. <laughs> you do it. Make that up. You know, we're going to spend a whole half hour talking to you about uh, your music and everything in the world and what you like and dislike. So start us off with some music here. Sure. I woke up today to find that I'm the victim of a crime The perpetrator led without a trace I assess the situation Conduct my own investigation The heat is on us so begins the chase I have my heart on the lock and key but somehow you infiltrated me And I won't rest until you're doing time One ever dies It's just a flick of them is over And they never tell you why But boy, I'm really glad I came I'm hoping that you feel the same I really love the movie of your life Hi everybody, welcome to Sidewalks. You know, Frank Sinatra, uh, Dean Martin, and uh, Bobby Darren are just some of the names people used to call them crooners. Well, uh, many people are calling this gentleman a modern day crooner. I'd like to welcome singer, songwriter, Spencer Day. How are you Hello. doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Good thanks to for, be here. Thanks for coming on Sidewalks. Absolutely. In your definition, what is a crooner? Well. The crooner is kind of a complicated term. It can be a little bit limiting sometimes. Um, it was actually used as a, as a negative, and then it, over time it's become actually to be a positive term. But during Frank Sinatra's time, uh, it was um, kind of a term for someone who sang in a melodramatic, overly sentimental fashion. And so Frank Sinatra actually never himself liked the term. For me, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. I always kind of think of myself almost more as a modern day torch singer in a way, which is, you know, someone who sings a balladeer, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know, because I think it's constantly changing, you know, the, as, as the term has come along. Now it's usually associated with being a positive thing and having a very smooth, generally baritone voice. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I'll take whatever the compliments people can throw my way. Well, you've been a lot of compliments I've seen on your Facebook and Twitter page. Everybody loves you. <laughs> well, the ones on there maybe do. There's probably a lot who don't, but <laughs> fortunately they don't. Well, after this interview, much. they're going to know all about you. Street lights up the same old block, a frozen clock, a welcome mat, and an open door. So familiar, but it's strange, nothing changed, but nothing's like it was before. I'm going home, I'm going home. Wherever that may be, I'm going home. Yeah. I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going home. You're from um, Utah, right? You Originally, yeah, Utah and uh, then Arizona after that. Yeah. So was singing something you always wanted to do when you were growing up? 
No, I mean, I guess somewhere inside I did, but uh, I didn't really find the passion for it till I was probably about 20 or 21 and didn't really start singing in public very much until I was about that age as well. Mm -hmm. And I heard that um, you weren't quite sure about doing it, but a roommate of yours might have said, hey, I heard you in the shower or something and heard you singing and said, you should really pursue this? Yeah, yeah, that, um, that was kind of my divine intervention in a way. I think at the time I was very aimless in my early 20s and, and like... A lot of Jack Mormons, like an Amish boy on Rumspringa in Fort Lauderdale. For spring break, I was ready to party. So I was, I was wild and crazy. And, and um, him suggesting I should go to LACC and take a music class, and he bought me my first Casio keyboard, was really awesome because that's really what got me started finding an outlet for kind of some of the dark feelings I had and ended up being the one escape I found that didn't leave me with a hangover the next day too, which is cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, that, that, is, that is how it started. So you, you went from Arizona and then went to California and you, did you have any idea what you were going to do or you were just going to hopefully? No, I just, um, it was either that or go on a Mormon mission and that, that wasn't really speaking to me. Um, so I just kind of packed everything in my car and headed out to California and I, I didn't know what was awaiting me or what I was going to do. I was really, you know, I was just ready to kind of see, see the world, and, which has also ended up being great because now that I do it for a living, I get, yeah. to, I get to see the world all the time, sometimes more than I want to. Now when you were, um, before um, uh, you were there, you did a lot of piano bars and retirement homes and is that where you're performing when you came to California? Yeah well I mean I started just playing and writing songs on my own and I kind of had a very musically schizophrenic background is that I would start playing in dive bars and piano bars and, and then retirement homes in Palm Springs and uh, I loved all these old standards and from the Frank Sinatra era and before that um, but at the same time I was really into Radiohead and I went to a lot of raves and I was really into Underworld and a lot of electronica so so I was kind of always trying to reconcile my love of these two different uh, types of music and, and I think to this day that's kind of my artistic goal is to always find a hybrid between my love of the Great American Songbook and then putting it in a more contemporary context. So you got your chance to make your uh, to get a wider audience with an appearance on Star Search, uh, the one that Arsenio Hall hosted, the revival. Um, how'd you get involved with that? Well, Kudos for, for digging that up, though, because I usually, that, nev that never comes up, because I, I think it only lasted a couple of seasons. Um, but it was kind of a joke. The, the piano bar I was playing in San Francisco, uh, the manager signed me up kind of as, as a joke, and I was like, okay, very funny. I'll go down and, and audition for it. And then I actually got on the show, and it wasn't a joke anymore. Um, but the judges never really cared for me. I had uh, uh, Naomi Judd. Um, Jessica Simpson and Lance Bass were the guest judges, and they liked me. Um, and then that incredible songster, uh, Ben Stein. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know so well about known music. For his, uh, for his uh, singing stylings. I'm not sure why he was a judge, but they never, they never really cared for me. Um, but the home audiences kept voting me back on, and I kind of wanted to do it once and then get off. But then I ended up being down in L.A. for, for a couple of months. And then um, was a finalist, but then happily lost, which is how I wanted it to go. And then I went back to playing these dive bars as if nothing had changed, except now I had girls in, uh, in Iowa, you know, making fan clubs pages for me and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then after that, I slowly started playing more places like the Plush Room here in San Francisco. And then I moved to New York and I, I got signed in my first development deal. And um, then I got dropped. Then I moved back to L.A. and got signed by my present record company. And, and it's, it's, it's been a, a very slow build, but I'm really happy with it because it's given me time to really adjust to accepting, well, this is what, for better or worse, this is what my life is going to be, because it wasn't a dream I had as a kid. Yeah. I didn't feel like you ever got a dream that big where I came from. So it's, you know, it's been, I'm really happy with how it's gone so far, because it's, I've really been able to feel like I'm really ready for it and able to show up for whatever lies ahead now. Exactly. Like you said, it wasn't uh, a major impact, but it, your career has, you know, grown, you're rising. Um, and we're going to talk about your, some of your albums, and we're going to talk about you know, your inspiration of music. So we'll be back with more Spencer Day when the um, Sidewalks continues. Can you take us out with a little music sure. for a break? So I cross my heart and count to ten. Here I go again, here I go again. Oh no, here I go again, here I go again. Oh no, here I go. A sleepless night in the city 
no peace and quiet in the city It's hotter than the water from a boiler in the basement of hell In this low and a wacker broken down hotel Counting the cracks on the ceiling Flat on my back And I'm feeling lower than the roaches In the tunnels of the one and the night And the clock tells me that I'm You had a um, song called Till You Come To Me That was your, I, I have it down here It was the rank number one on the Smooth Jazz Top 20 Countdown um, When you first heard it, what, what was it like hearing it on the radio? Well, I mean, I was driving around L.A. in a, in a rental car, and uh, it just was what was left on the station. So it was, you know, I got to say, it's pretty thrilling. I definitely had to call my mom and, and stop. And since I've heard that, whether I'm in a grocery store or a deli or wherever I hear it, I'd still get, you know. Because, <laughs> no, you know, a lot of people don't know who I am. So if I go into that, they, you know, it's still kind of thrilling for me because, I, you know, it's like this little secret I know. You've had, you've been making your own albums. Uh, actually, your first two, uh, Introducing Spencer Day and uh, The Movie of Your Life. Those were s albums you actually put together yourself and distribute, correct? Yeah, well, they were just initially started out as demos and we thought, well, you know, let, let's put them out. And, uh, and then uh, Vagabond actually started as a self-release thing, but my A&R guy, at my record label Concord, um, came, w happened to be at the studio where I was recording the track live and he saw me in the booth and then asked my producer at the time, uh, you know, who's, who's the kid in the booth? Oh really? <laughs> Basically, yeah. and, and that's how I got signed to my record label now. What was that the feeling like to get actually signed by a record label? Con Concord's a uh, pretty big one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got, they got uh, Paul Simon right now, they got James Hunter, they have Esperanza Spalding, they got some great people. Um, it was really cool. Once again, it's kind of surreal. It's taken a lot of meditating on it and kind of preparing myself for a reality and a success that I never even fathomed or thought about as a kid. So, so it's, it's been cool. It's just uh, it's taken a lot of uh, constant reevaluation to kind of take a look at it, my life and say, okay, these are the pros and the cons of a life lived uh, in the public and a life lived on the stage. Yeah. Now, um, you have another album, the, the Mystery of You. Every time I read anything about the album, they always said something, you were, you were on the dark side, you had a rough time a little bit. Um, t can you explain a little bit about that? What that sure. Um, well, you know, my whole life I had really suffered from mood swings. I mean, I was actually suicidally depressed when I was about oh, wow. nine years old. Um, and I kind of never would understand it because then a couple, you know, weeks later I'd be totally fine and on top of the world again. Um, and I had a breakup about, you know, four and a half years ago, and I think that that might have triggered, I guess, what might be called a manic depressive episode, and I just kind of started crying one day, and I couldn't stop. It was, I really fell into a deep clinical depression, and in a way, though, it ended up being the best thing that ever happened to me, because I think it had been something I'd suffered from my entire life, and all of a sudden, I had to really, I was forced to deal with it and really take a look at myself and some of the ways that I was really not taking care of myself enough. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, been, it's been hugely transformational. I mean, it's still, it's still, you know, will always be a very painful thing and losing someone you love is always, is always hard. Yeah. But um, it, it ended up being one of the best opportunities for growth and self-exploration that I've had. And um, this record for me was really about that. I wanted to chronicle all the different stages of the relationship I was in, but I also wanted to really document my recovery from it. And um, I think that's, for me, the real success story that I have so far is that I've really come through it. And so when I perform, it's changed how I perform because I really hope to inspire people that if you are in a dark place, you really can come through it and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And, and I've been on both sides to see it. So it's, yeah. uh, it, it, for being a dark thing, uh, hopefully there's a lot of light involved in the story. Um, we're going to take another break right here, but uh, what's your favorite song on the uh, Mystery of You? I really like this track, I Don't Want to Know, because when we recorded I did it live and I just felt very vulnerable and very emotionally connected to it. But I like them all, you know, it's kind of like children. You might have one you know is a little brighter than the other ones, but mm -hmm. you never tell them. <laughs> 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 you know, that, and you love them all the same. So, uh, but that, that one I'm, I'm particularly fond of. And, um, Can and you play a little bit while we're going to break? Sure. Here's Spencer Day. Dead 
middle of the night with your tires on the gravel. Your key in the lock and a distant hello. When did our love begin to Searching for words, you're hoping won't hurt me. But I know you're trying to soften the blow. How many days until you Look in the future here for a second. Uh, let's say it's 20 years from now, or even 30. How do you want people to know about Spencer Day and his legacy of music? Well, first and foremost, I hope that, you know, should I not be here in 30 years, you hopefully will be I here. am. You will be. <laughs> Definitely no doubt. You, you, get a, you had Grammy Awards already, American Music Awards, uh, awards we, you know, every kind of award out there. That I've, I've had all that? Well, I mean, and that stuff's all, all great. I think ultimately I'd like to be remembered for someone who was a, a really good person and was responsible for being on the right side of history and a part of good social change that benefited the human race. And I mean, that's, and I'd love to know that I had the artistic freedom to really do all the things I want to do because there's still so many things I want to do. I really want to write more musicals. I love writing for other people. And there's so many amazing people I'd love to collaborate with and, and work with. And uh, so f for me, I, I think hopefully that's what I'm remembered is, is just in a positive way, whether that, whether millions of people know who I am or whether I kind of fade into oblivion. You know, I think that I just want to know that in some small way I, I helped push the human race forward towards uh, being in a better place. No, you're, you're just like Star Trek. You, you bring everything to a better place. Your music is great. Boldly you going where no crooner has gone that's before. That's right. <laughs> Live long and prosper. <laughs> Spencer. Oh, oh, there. And he got it. He got the walking <laughs> salute right here on sidewalks. Hey, Spencer, thank you very much for thank coming on the show. Appreciate it. Pleasure. For more full-length celebrity interviews, visit SidewalksTV.com.